Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon to hear about the updates to our methodology for the vintage 2021 estimate series. My name is Christine Hartley and I'm the assistant division chief for estimates and projections in the population division at the US Census Bureau. Today, I'll begin by sharing some background on the population estimates program and briefly reviewing our processes and methods at a high level. Then I'll describe how the challenges that we encountered for developing our vintage 2021 estimates inspired us to manage those challenges in special ways, including the development of a blended population estimates base. And finally, I will share our plans for future research and vintages. We hope that this information will be interesting to you as well as helpful for planning for your own research, which may rely on our estimates. The Population Estimates Program is responsible for developing annual estimates products to satisfy a mandate to Congress as per Title 13, Section 181. These are the official estimates of population and housing units for the Census Bureau, and they are used to distribute federal funds, develop weights for demographic surveys, facilitate planning at the state and local levels, and to generally inform the public about changes to the nation's population. Over the past couple years, for example, the estimates were used to distribute over $200 billion to states and cities as part of the 2020 CARES Act and the 2021 American Rescue Plan. The latest estimates that we've published are for July 1st, 2020, although we have estimates on our website dating back to 1900. And of course, presently, we are preparing for the release of our new July 1st, 2021 estimates. Every year we release estimates for over 80,000 areas in the United States and Puerto Rico. You can see here that our geographic detail covers the nation, regions and divisions, states in Puerto Rico, metropolitan and micropolitan statistical areas, counties and municipios, and finally, incorporated places and minor civil divisions, also referred to as cities and towns. The detail that we publish varies by level of geography, which is summarized uh, here in this table. We release estimates down to uh, the county level by demographic characteristics, age, sex, race, and Hispanic origin, estimates of total population down to cities and towns. We also publish estimates of the group quarters population by age, sex, race, and Hispanic origin for the nation, total group, po to total group quarters population for states and counties, and housing unit estimates for the nation, states, and counties. The estimates are published on a rolling basis beginning in December of each year with the total population, components of change, and voting each population for the nation, states, and Puerto Rico. In March, we release county, metro and micro, and municipio total population and components of change for counties and micropolitan and micro metropolitan and micropolitan statistical areas. National population by single year of age and sex comes out in April. Total population for cities and towns, as well as housing units for the nation, states, and counties are published in May. And finally, our estimates by demographic characteristics for the nation, states, counties, Puerto Rico Commonwealth, and the municipios are published in June. For population estimates at the county level and above, the POP Estimates Program utilizes the cohort component method to measure population changes since the last census through the use of a variety of administrative records on births, deaths, and migration. Sources include the National Center for Health Statistics, Internal Revenue Service, Social Security Administration, Defense Manpower Data Center, and survey data from the American Community Survey and Puerto Rico Community Survey. We also work closely with state demographers through our partnership group, the Federal State Cooperative for Population Estimates, or FSCPE. At the sub-county geography level, the population estimates for cities and towns are created by distributing the county population estimates to each place within the county based on that place's ratio of household pop to the total housing units. We add that to the estimate of the population in group quarters to get the total resident population. And finally, our estimates of housing units are also produced with a component-based method that starts with the most recent decennial census and uses a variety of survey and administrative data to estimate change in the housing stock, specifically in terms of building permits, estimates of non-permitted construction, mobile home shipments, and estimates of housing. 
Data sources include the Building Permit Survey, Survey of Construction, Manufactured Home Survey, American Community Survey, and the Federal Emergency Management Agency Individual Records on Requests for Disaster Assistance. Our general methodological approach each year is to revise our entire time series of estimates beginning at the date of the last census and up to the vintage year, which represents the last year of estimates available. So for example, our upcoming vintage 2021 estimate series contains estimates for April 1st, 2020 through July 1st, 2021. From vintage to vintage, there are three types of updates that we may incorporate into the time series. First, Base population is updated each year to reflect legal boundary changes or other geographic updates. It may also be updated uh, due to count question resolution changes. Then, as more recent or complete data become available, such as births or deaths or the components that we use for our housing unit estimates, we use those to update the estimates of the components of change. We may also revise the methods for how we estimate the various components and what you'll see is that the data updates are more likely to affect the estimates for the most recent years, while the method revisions generally affect the time series cumulatively from the census date forward. And finally, we may improve the method of tying all of the components together and generating the estimates. And this type of change also affects the series from the census date forward. A key detail regarding our methodology is that, as you have already heard me say a couple times, traditionally we use the results of the latest decennial census to serve as the base for our estimates. And then annually we measure change since the last census to update our entire time series. However, uh, early on as we began to witness changes to the 2020 census operational schedule resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic, it became apparent that downstream delays in the availability of the census data were likely. For months, it wasn't clear uh, what data would be available and when, impacting our ability to plan for the vintage 2021 estimate space, as well as other major products, such as our 2010 to 2020 intercensal estimates, which rely on the census data to serve as the endpoint for that time series. And because of how the pandemic impacted census field operations, there were also many questions about quality. So if we had the 2020 census data available to us, how much time would we need to evaluate the results and determine if they were suitable for our specific use. And given the Census Bureau's new disclosure avoidance strategy, would it be possible to undertake an evaluation of this magnitude and finalize a method to make the vintage 2021 estimates differentially private? All we knew for sure um, was that we needed some kind of solution which did not fully rely on 2020 census data. And what we came up with is to create what we're calling a blended base. So this method begins with the April 1st, 2020 value from our already published, our already published Vintage 2020 Estimate Series, which is based on the 2010 census. Then to create a plausible base, it controls this April 1st, 2020 value to our National 2020 Demographic Analysis Estimates distribution by single year of age and sex and counting total population from the 2020 census, PL94171 redistricting data. So with the time that we had available to us, this represented the most detail that we could confidently incorporate into the estimate space. For those of you who may not be familiar with the demographic analysis estimates, or DA as we call them, uh, these are national level estimates for April 1st, 2020, produced using current and historical vital records, data on international migration, and Medicare records. So the primary difference between the vintage estimates and the DA estimates is that we don't use census data as a base for DA. The DA estimates are entirely independent of the census, and as such, they're used as one of the official measures of coverage for the census. We have a very high level of confidence in these as to why they were deemed a reliable data source to pull in for the blended base. Back to the base. The outcome is that for vintage 2021, the April 1st, 2020 estimates of total population for counties and higher levels of geography will match the published results of the 2020 census. Demographic detail in the estimates will come from a combination of the vintage 2020 estimate series and the 2020 demographic analysis estimates. 
So a possible limitation of this approach is that where we see gaps in the detail that we're getting from the controls, like for race or Hispanic origin, we're filling them in with detail from our vintage 2020 estimates. Although this isn't necessarily a negative thing, but it does mean that any potential issues from vintage 2020 get carried into vintage 2021 unless we have a separate data source serving as the control. However, this approach has numerous benefits as well, particularly that whereas it doesn't rely on the 2020 census, it provides some level of consistency with it. Then it is an adaptive framework, meaning that we can continue to use this approach for as long as necessary, but we can also improve upon its estimates by pulling in additional data from the 2020 census or other sources to serve as controls. This is contingent upon the results of research over the coming year, which I will be getting into in just a bit. So what I described on the previous slide, neatly approach for our county level estimates and higher levels of geography. But if you recall from earlier in the presentation, our sub-county estimates are handled with a separate methodology, and subsequently, a different approach was necessary for our sub-county population estimates base. The sub-county methodology relies on a place's ratio of how the total housing units. So as it is, the 2020 census housing unit counts are invariant, which means they don't get infused with differentially private noise. So to retain our current methodology, we only needed a solution for the household and group quarters populations. What we determined is that the most straightforward and effective way to produce these subcounty estimates is to use the results of the 2020 census, which are available, available to us on the internal unprotected census edited file or CEF, and then infuse noise into the household and group quarters data. So if we do this in the estimate space, the rest of our methodology can remain unchanged and then the sub-county estimates get control to the county level blended base. And by starting from the staff instead of the public census data, we maintain the ability to apply annual geographic updates to the data, something that is critical for producing accurate estimates at these low levels of geography, and which is not possible with the information available on the public census data files, such as the PL94-171 redistricting data. To that end, we collaborated with the Bureau's Disclosure Avoidance staff in the Center for Enterprise Dissemination to develop an appropriate differential privacy mechanism, and our proposal received approval from the Data Stewardship Executive Policy Committee earlier this month. For the Population Estimates Program, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic was not limited to our April 1st, 2020 estimate space. After all, our Vintage 2021 Estimate Series extends from April 1st, 2020 through July 1st, 2021, a period that falls entirely within the pandemic. As such, there were also effects on the components of change that we used to update the base population. So each had to be evaluated in order to determine whether adjustments would be needed to more accurately capture the impact of the pandemic. For births and deaths, we were able to pull in the most current provisionally available by the National Center for Health Statistics. These data account for the increased mortality and changes to natality that took place over the course of the pandemic. For international migration, we typically rely on the American Community Survey to serve as an input. But of course, the ACS had its own suite of issues and we could not use the 2020 file for this purpose. So instead, we used current data from the Department of Justice, Department of Homeland Security, State Department, and the Institute of International Education to calculate an adjustment that we could apply to the 2019 ACS estimates. And finally, for domestic migration, historical trends in the IRS tax return data that we use in our method were examined to determine if the extension to filing deadlines affected data quality in any significant way. And we also data sources, such as Civil Services National Change of Address File. And we were able to determine that no adjustment to our source data or method was needed. All of the changes that we applied will be described in more detail in our Vintage 2021 method statement and the release November with our first data release of the Vintage. Regarding next steps, 
Uh, we are in the process of producing and reviewing the estimates for counties and higher levels of geography, followed closely by production of our sub-county population and housing unit estimates. And in the meantime, we'll be continuing our stakeholder outreach on the finalized methodology, uh, such as doing webinars like this one and also some other engagements. And finally, once we have everything settled for Vintage 2021, we shift gears and we begin planning for Vintage 2022. So at this time, there are still many unknowns for the POP estimates program, particularly regarding the timeline for receiving 2020 census data. And of course, this influences our options for Vintage, 20, uh, vintage 2022's population base, but it also influences our ability to produce the 2010 to 2020 intercensal estimates, which is generally a popular product. We also have questions regarding whether the 2020 census data will be sufficient for our use in the vintage 2022 estimate space. So our intention is to use coverage methods, um, coverage measures that is, such as demographic analysis, and also the results from our robust internal estimates evaluation project, or E2, to make these determinations. E2 makes a series of comparisons between our vintage 2020 estimates and the results of the 2020 census, and then evaluates those differences. Typically, the differences are regarded as error in the estimates, and they're used to inform research and method improvements over the coming decade. But this time around, given all the complexities of the 2020 census, the evaluation of differences is expected to be more nuanced. And it will help us to determine if there are any specific geographies or characteristics that could introduce challenges if we use them in the estimate space, or possibly whether there's additional demographic detail that we feel we can incorporate into a blended base for Vintage 2022. As I mentioned previously, a major benefit of the blended base is that it's adaptive. So we can use it as long as we need to, or even improve upon it from Vintage, uh, from vintage to Vintage as we explore the possibility of switching over to using 2020 census data as the base. But the findings from E2 are really going to be the driving force for determining what direction we take for future vintages. And that research is ramping up as we speak, so we expect to have findings that we can share over the course of 2022. And of course, our intent is to keep all of our customers and data users informed as decisions are made so that you all may plan accordingly. And to that end, we're about to open up uh, to questions, which you can enter into the Q&A tool. But if you need any more information at any time, you can reach out to the Coordination, Dissemination, and Outreach Branch, which is located in the Estimates and Projections area of the Population Division. And the contact information for that branch is available on this slide, along with the link to the Population and Housing Unit Estimates website, where you can access the schedule for our release, uh, data releases, and also our method statement and other technical documentation. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we are very happy to take any questions you may have, and I have a number of members of my team here to assist as needed. Thanks, Christine. Before we go into questions, uh, I will say that um, there was a question regarding slides. So the slide deck, along with the webinar recording or in transcript, will be available within about two weeks, and that'll be posted on census.gov. Our first question uh, comes from a data user uh, who studies African immigration, and they wanted to hear more about um, the international migration component in the estimates. Great. Um, I will turn that right over to Jason Schachter, who is our NET International Migration Branch. Hi, everyone. Um, could you repeat the question again for me, please? Just more information Absolutely. about how we did the adjustment? Absolutely. So um, this data user, specifically, they're interested in African immigration, but they just wanted to hear about that international migration component in the estimates. For, for the COVID adjustment or just in general on, on the estimate? In general. All right. In, in general, you know, we have, uh, we use the American Community Survey primarily as our major data source. We have a number of different components. One is uh, the foreign-born immigration component. 
Another piece is foreign-born emigration, so an estimate of those leaving the country. We also have a net native component for, for um, U.S. born. And we also have a Puerto Rico piece as well as a military, net military movement piece. So those are the five general um, pieces that go into our international migration estimate. I guess that would be my, my summary for that. And there are actually lots of details on how we uh, generate our net international migration component in the method statement that's available on our site. So that's probably the best source to go to for more details. And then if there are follow-up questions, you can email the address on the slide uh, with your specific questions. Thanks, Jason and Christine. Our next question um, is asking uh, for more detail on how it was decided that 2020 census alone cannot underpin the estimates. Specifically, some users develop cohort component projections relying on five-year age, sex, decennial enumeration. So the primary factor that drove us to developing the blended base was the availability of the data. So, you know, we have our own estimates, project, uh, estimates production schedule, um, which we follow in order to meet our legislatively mandated deadline to release estimates by the end of the year. And the input data that we would need from the census was just simply not available to us internally in time to be able to evaluate it and use it for um, the production of the estimate space. So there's nothing at this point that we can say about comparisons, uh, you know, in terms of specific detail, like age detail. Um, we didn't necessarily evaluate the data and determine that it wasn't good enough quality. It was just really that we didn't have the time to do that evaluation. So that's what we're gonna be focusing on over this next year with our estimates evaluation project. And then that will be where we are actually looking at the, the detail and the differences between the estimates and the census and deciding like if it's up to the specific standard that that fine level of detail that we need um, in order to use it in our estimates production. Thanks, Christine. Next question, um, are there changes in the structural outputs of ACS pumps products that we need to reprogram around, or do the outputs adhere to prior parameters despite methodological changes? I am not specifically familiar with the ACS pumps products. Is anybody who is on the Q&A panel familiar with them? Well, if you're talking about the, the ACS controls to the population estimates that we, we make in the population division. So if you're, like to any extent that they use our estimates as, um, as weight, then yeah, this would affect their PUMS data. However, I can't think of a specific reason why this particular methodology would affect PUMS data any differently than just a regular um, census base would. Does that make sense? What we're able to provide to the ACS for the survey weights should be unchanged, even though it's developed from a different type of estimate space. Um, but if they are making any changes to the structural output of the ACS PUMS product, that would be a better question for somebody from the ACS program. Um, if you aren't able to find a good email address for that, you could, again, email pop.cdob at census.gov, and we could provide to you an email address to reach out to the ACS program. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Christine. Uh, next question is, if the methods um, you spoke about are going to be uh, included through 2030? That is actually the big question. So um, at this point, what we know is that we're going to be using it for this vintage 2021 production it seems extremely likely that we'll be doing some kind of version of a blended base for vintage 2022, um, but we are gonna be relying on our research, uh, the estimates evaluation research that we do over the coming year to decide whether or not there's gonna be a point at which we can you know, use the 2020 census data as the base, or if it's always gonna be you know, up until 2030, some kind of blend. But at this time, we don't have that information, but we are actively investigating. I would add to that that we also think, um, given what we what we know so far, that including the demographic analysis estimates, 
to adjust age and sex is an improvement to the quality of the data. Um, so I, at least I personally, I'm hoping we're able to maintain that, but it's really going to depend, like Christine said, on what the estimates evaluation project shows about the annual. Next question asked. Is the link uh, to the methodology for um, additional information? Thanks, yes, Amal. Like Next question asks um, if we're able to share the blended based data and when will the July 2021 data be released? So, right now, our release is for December 21st. So that'll be the point in time where you can see the July 1st, 2021 time series, as well as the updated methodology statement and release notes, which cover the development of the blended base. Great. Next question asks, at some point in the future, will you compare data from the blended base method to what you would have gotten if you had used the 2020 census data as the base for different demographic groups like minorities or children? That's a good question. I mean, it kind of assumes that we'll have a method to create the base from the 2020 census data to compare to. If we did go down that path, you know, we were evaluating the census data you know, it met all of our needs and we decided to use it for the base. Um, I definitely expect that we would be making comparisons between that and the latest iteration of the blended base, um, probably as part of our review process, you know, to examine the differences by, you know, the different demographic characteristics. Um, but whether we ever end up with that 2020 census base, you know, that will definitely be contingent on the estimates evaluation research. But, um, but yeah, if that happens, we'll be looking at those comparisons. Next question is about uh, DA or demographic analysis. Um, how do the limitations of the Hispanic data and the DA, given that Hispanic data are available for only the population on theory, affect the quality of Hispanic data in the blended base? So actually at this time, we're not using the Hispanic Hispanic data from demographic analysis. We're only using the data by age and sex. And uh, the, the reason we made the decision was because of the age data, um, the same can actually be said for the race data. We only had the black, non-black race groups. Um, and so we didn't have enough time to investigate how we could account for those limitations for the race and Hispanic origin data. So, so that's why we incorporated this vintage, but um, that's something that we'll be looking into. Actually, to that end, I'll add that. So the Hispanic origin data that you see in the blended base are coming from the vintage 2020 estimates. Next question asks about the new data sources. Are those new data sources more or less likely to pick up people in households who are often left off the decennial census forms, such as doubled up households? I'm not so sure. Are you, are you talking about specifically for the blended base? Um, oh, I forgot I, I forgot to introduce myself last time. My name is Ben Bolander. <laughs> I'm a senior technical advisor for population division and uh, co-lead of this, this team for the last few years. Um, it shouldn't necessarily, like there shouldn't necessarily be a direct interaction between picking up uh, combined households and that kind of thing, because we're not using, at least for the county level, we're not using housing unit data in order to make the blended base. So to the extent that the demographic analysis control adjusts age and sex, or that the population estimates with the administrative records was picking up on a different number of people in a housing unit or in, in housing units or in an area than there were before, it's possible. But it, again, it's not, because this wasn't a direct survey method um, with demographic analysis and census totals and the vintage 2020 population estimates, 
it, it's really impossible for me to say anything about that level of detail. Thanks, Ben. Next question is asking um, if the up, new methodological updates um, will they impact the undercount of Black and Hispanic populations or, or other minority groups? So the new methodology does impact the distribution of the population, uh, but right now it's primarily by the age and sex detail that we're using from demographic analysis. Um, Ben or Luke, do you want to elaborate on that at all? Yeah, so, um, and Luke can, can follow up if he, if he has more. Um, the test that we did with using black and non-black from demographic analysis did show um, a bit of difference between what we would have gotten from decennial using the PL data, but there's a few questions about that. Number one, and I, th I think Christina addressed this, the decennial census, the PL data does not have modified race. So some other race is an option. So it's really hard to make a direct comparison until there's a method created um, to convert that data into the modified race uh, categories. And the other reason is it did seem to adjust the um, black alone, not black alone group, a sizable chunk. Um, and we were concerned, we didn't have the time to do the research about what that would do to different areas at the subnational level. So at the national level, it made a reasonably, like a noticeable difference, but we didn't have any way to specifically target how that adjustment was applied down through um, all of the lower level of geography and other characteristics. So just because the national level went up or down didn't mean that, you know, a county that had a particularly high under or over count would have been corrected, if that makes sense. Thanks, Ben. We have a question um, asking about if the five-year estimates would still be released um, in December. I, I have a feeling that's regarding the American Community Survey. It sounds like it, and I don't recall what the plan is for the five-year estimates. Again, is anybody on the panel more in tune with the release schedule for ACS? I, I believe it's been postponed until March next year. Okay. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Jason. Regarding uh, the doubled up households, there was some clarification that was sent in. Um, they're wondering if the new data sources, because they are not household based, might pick up people that don't show up in household based methods, such as uh, teen mothers and young babies. Because the DA data is for the resident population, it is possible. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't differentiate between um, household population and group quarters population. Uh, so how the process works is we actually create resident population. At least for this year, um, we we create a blended base for the resident population all the way down to the full levels of detail that we need, and then we proportioned it out to households and group quarters based on the proportion that was in the Vintage 2020 estimates. Um, so it, next year, one of the things we're looking into uh, discussing is, is whether or not we should create each of the universe estimates separately. So should we create the household and group quarters population separately and then add them to get resident? Um, or should we continue on the way, the way that we're doing it now? So yes, to the extent that a resident population measure might pick up on um, a different amount of household or group quarters population, it would be really hard to give a definitive answer uh, one way or the other if it's actually doing that. I hope that makes sense and clarifies. Thanks, Ben. I'm not seeing any further questions at this time. I'll give 
folks a few more minutes if they're in the middle of typing. Again, um, you can submit your question through the Q&A uh, text box if you have a question. We had a question regarding differential privacy that just got submitted. Um, how does the differential privacy instituted on the data that the POP, POP estimates will use differ from the process used on the census data that are released to the public? So at this time, uh, we are only implementing differential privacy on our sub-county population estimates. Um, and I think that the biggest difference between the process used for the census data and ours is that Ours is for a much more limited set of data, so it was kind of tailored to just sub-county household and sub-county group quarters population. So um, we, you know, applied for a specific privacy loss budget or epsilon level to apply to the sub-county population estimates, whereas for the data that were released uh, in the redistricting data file, they had to kind of fine-tune that system for a much larger uh, amount of data so ultimately, uh, we're using, you know, a similar system because we collaborated with the state that are producing differentially private estimates for the census, but it's just on a smaller scale. I don't know if Ben or Luke want to elaborate on that at all. Uh, I, I can add something to that. So for South County, the top, uh, we're using the same algorithm, the top-down algorithm. Mm -hmm to introduce noise to the sub-county population. The only difference is the number of cells that are added to. So the more, the, the larger the number of cells, the more noise is introduced. And being, having a specific uh, algorithm for the sub-county, it, it limits the number, uh, the, it limits the noise that is introduced to that. So yep. we, uh, if we, if we're adding noise to 100 cells, it's not the same thing as we're adding noise to 40,000 cells. So the more cells we have, the more noise is introduced. And we're trying to minimize that noise. That's why we requested a specific algorithm tailored for the sub-county population. Yeah, okay. we're, using, we're using the Python code that was provided to us by the Research and Methodology Division. So we're we're using mechanically the same thing that they're using for decennial to infuse noise into the data. Like Amel said, we just have a lot fewer cells, so it's a lot easier to optimize for it. Um, we're also not as constrained with the sub-county estimates about all of the um, aggregations having to add up. Like, because we're only doing total household and GQ population, they only have to add up to total household and GQ population. They don't have to deal with age, sex, race, Hispanic origin, and, and, you know, the thousands of categories that that brings. The more characteristics so, so mechanic, you add, mechanic the wise, more, it's the same Python code. Yeah, so the more characteristics you add, the more uh, noise you're adding to your uh, estimates or your counts. And by, uh, for sub-county, we don't have any characteristics, so it's just population total for cities and towns, and that helps minimize the noise introduced and getting more accurate estimates to our local governments. To continue with differential privacy, there's a question about um, if the uh, DP methodology privacy loss budget, uh, will that be shared in a similar manner as the redistricting product? I don't know what manner the redistricting privacy loss budget was shared in, but um, our privacy loss budget for the sub-county estimates was 3.0. I don't think that that's sensitive information, um, so. Uh, it, it's 3.0 per year, and w the current plan is to be able to rerun that on the base every year for the decade, so uh, a grand total privacy loss budget for the sub-county population estimate space of 30 using three per year. If everything continues to go according to plan. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. 
Next question is asking about um, when the uh, next round of intercensal estimates will be released. So the release schedule for the intercensal estimates is contingent upon when internally we have access to the demographic and housing characteristics file, which will be the next 2020 census data file. Um, I think that the timeline for that is still kind of being worked out, but our best guess is that we will see that file sometime late 2022. Um, so if you take production into account, I'm gonna estimate that possibly early 2023 is when the intercensals will be completed and released. Thanks, Christine. Sure. Next question, uh, will total population in the July 1st, 2021 estimates be consistent with the 2020 census results for all geographies? So definitely for counties and higher levels of geography, we're using that uh, control from the PL94 redistricting data file. So they'll be consistent um, for April 1st, 2020. Um, in the sub-county population estimates, because we are using the methodology that infuses noise, they will be slightly different for the estimates mm -hmm. base. And the estimates geography is different than what the Seniel uses, so they would be different anyway. Um, right. The, the main difference is that census geography uses um, census designated places, um, and uh, I can't remember what the name of the other one is right now but the, the census equivalent of minor civil divisions and uh, place parts and the estimates program doesn't use that. We only, oh, with a couple of exceptions, we only create estimates for um, places that have a functioning uh, local government unit. And then the rest usually gets put into balance of county. Um, so it wouldn't have matched exactly anyway because the geography is different. But Christine's right with the with the perturbations that we're adding with the um, the differential privacy mechanism, it is going to be a little bit different, even for places that have the exact same geography. It's not one to one equivalent, so it won't match anyway. Thank you. Uh, next question, if a blended base with differential privacy noise is used through 2030, could a sub-county place receive positive noise in one year and negative noise in the following year? Yes. Um, because, because the way that we add the noise and they're technically independent from each other, so we would run this, this algorithm on the base every year it, it's fairly likely that it would go back and forth. Um, so like this year, maybe it'll be, uh, you know, plus five and next year it'll be minus two or whatever. Um, by not adding differentially private noise to the estimates itself, you don't end up with compounding error. Um, you end up, because we're only changing the base, it would be, that would equi equate to like a, a plus two or a minus five or whatever for the entire time series as opposed to having a situation where you add five in the first year of the time series, and then you're adding another 10, so now you're 15 higher, and then you're adding another five, so now you're 20 higher. Um, because it's a cross-sectional thing just at the base, and we're not adding noise all the way throughout the process, uh, it will go, each, each individual area will go up and down slightly, at least that's what we would expect, um, but it shouldn't compound and get out of control. And I think an important ben, point to make, oh, go ahead, Amal. To add to what Ben mentioned, so at the sub-county level, we're um, starting with the census counts and applying the noise to it, which will essentially, will be um, monitored every run. So, and with every run, we're, you're adding a random noise, which will not, which have a limited bounds to it. So it will not exceed those bounds, which we are um, in control with those bounds. However, with every run, it will change. 
Right, I think it's important to emphasize that the amount of noise that we're infusing into the estimates is very, very minimal. So even if it does switch in the base from year to year, it shouldn't be a significant, you know, flip-flop. Um, and as Amel said, we're gonna, you know, be monitoring that from year to year. Next question. Will there be any kind of demonstration product for related to the use of differential privacy in the um, sub-county population estimates so users can assess the impact of differential privacy on the estimates? We don't have any specific plans to release a demonstration product. I don't know that we necessarily have the resources to support something like that, um, but that can be something that we take into consideration as we're kind of, you know, planning out our research for the next couple of years. Thanks, Christine. Another sure. question about um, the release schedule. Uh, what all is being released in December? In December, we are putting out the total population for the nation and states in Puerto Rico, as well as the components of change. So that'll be the birth, deaths, and migration, and also the 18 plus of voting age population for the nation, states, and Puerto Rico. And that'll be for April 1st, 2020 through July 1st, 2021. So you'll get the time series. Thanks, Christine. Uh, sure. We had a user who'd like a little bit more uh, definition or discussion around um, what we mean by noise. The noise is the amount of error that we're adding to a specific cell, which is which means it's the lowest um, the amount of error we're adding to the lowest level of uh, primitive geography, which is our um, the the it's an estimate it's the estimates geography universe that we're dealing with at the sub county level for uh, places and towns, and that uh, amount of noise is very very small at that primitive level, or and we're trying to add less than. Um, or equal to a half uh, a point to a specific primitive geography, uh, which is uh, the lowest level, like I said, um, the elemental level of uh, a unit of a geographic unit within the sub county that make up a place or a town. Uh, so a collection of primitive areas will make up that specific place uh, or town. Um, I'm, I'm curious if the question is even more um, like baseline than that. So what you do when you do differential privacy is you you take a random sample from a distribution like like a normal curve or a Laplace distribution and then you just add that to the number that you had. So if, if the population in a place was 500, you could take a random sample from say a, a Gaussian or a normal distribution and that random sample could be two. So then the population in that place is now um, what? 102 or 502 or whatever it is I said. Um, mathematically, it's not that hard. It's getting everything else, like it, all you're doing is taking a, a sample and adding that number to it. Um, but it gets complicated when you're trying to make everything balance and try to keep the overall levels of noise down. Um, because while it's very unlikely if you have, you know, an epsilon of three that you're gonna add 100,000 to, you know, a cell with five, it's technically possible. It's just super unlikely. I think something that's important to note is that the Census Bureau adopted differential privacy as its disclosure avoidance strategy. Um, there's a lot of information about it that's available on census.gov. Our program, um, is expected to adhere to that because it's an enterprise strategy. So um, we're following along, but it is by no means, you know, our expertise uh, in terms of relaying the, the details of differential privacy. So I definitely encourage you if uh, you're not very familiar with it or the decision-making process that the Bureau went through to check out the information that's available on the Census Bureau's website. Um, so. To that. <laughs> Thanks, Christina, Mel, and Ben. I'm not seeing any other questions at this time. 
I do know that there were some comments in the Q and A. I just wanted to assure everyone that we, uh, you know, we'll be taking those into consideration and discussing them, even if you didn't explicitly have a question. That you know, the information that you contributed to us and the feedback is still important. Thank you for that. We have a few more minutes left. Again, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A text box to submit your question. Do you see a couple more questions about the December release? Um, so just to clarify, the release for December will be for April 1st, 2020 through July 1st, 2021. Eventually, when we do create our 2010 to 2020 intercensal estimates, you'll be able to construct a time series from 2010 all the way forward to 2021. Um, but the, the new data that are coming out are specifically for April 1st, 2020, which will be the blended base through July 1st. Um, so that will all be included in the files that are available on the website in December. To respond Thanks. to the last question, um, the Vintage 2021 release will have a July 1st, 2021 data in it. And regarding what will be available in March, that will be the county level population estimates, uh, municipios, metropolitan and micropolitan statistical areas, and it will also be the components of change for the counties, uh, metro micros, and municipios. Thanks, Christine and Amel. There are no further questions at this time. Okay, everyone, thanks. That concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may disconnect at this time. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.